Romans 8, 28 came to mind. Um, we know that God causes all things to work together for good. To those who love God and those who are called according to his purpose. Jim knows that things do not happen by accident. You're not here by accident. What's going on out there, where you're at, does not happen by accident. And he's going to communicate some of that to you. Um, this is just kind of what I got from visiting with him, but let's bring him on with a great hand, guys. Why don't you all give a shout out to Lancaster that are watching this? They're all over here. Turn your scriptures to uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. We're going to pick it up in verse 6. Now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you keep away from every brother who leads an unruly life, and not according to the tradition which you receive from us. For you yourselves know how you ought to follow our example, because we did not act in an undisciplined manner among you. Nor did we eat anyone's bread without paying for it. But with labor and hardship, we kept working night and day, so that we would not be a burden to any of you. Not because we did not have the right to this, but in order to offer ourselves as a model for you, so that you would follow our example. For even when we were with you, we used to give you this order. If anyone is not willing to work, then he is not to eat either. For we hear that some among you are leading an undisciplined life, doing no work at all, but acting like busy bodies. Now such persons we command and exhort in the Lord Jesus Christ to work in quiet fashion and eat their own bread. But as for you, brethren, do not grow weary of doing good. If anyone does not obey our instruction in this letter, take special note of that person and do not associate with him so that he will be put to shame. Yet, do not regard him as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. When Jay asked me to speak on this subject, a great subject. But you know, when we look at this, we have to do some deep thinking about it. First of all, this country, we live at, we have probably 97 million people, or 93 million people, I think it is, that's out of work. We have another 50 million people or more that's on food stamps. Now, I have a question for you. Is there anybody here that's hungry? You see anybody that doesn't have enough food to eat? Even the illegals come in and they have plenty of food to eat. So what's this talking about? I don't doubt that there was people in that day that didn't work and they was expecting somebody else to feed them. We have the same thing today, but 
It's just somebody else that's feeding them. See, the government has become their God. I don't know if you noticed, but there was three commands that Paul brings up in this passage. Since all Scripture is inspired Word of God, Jesus said, if you love me, you keep my commandments. In Luke, he said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I tell you? Everyone who comes to me, he says, and hears my word and does them, I will show you what he is like. He is like a man building a house who dug deep and he laid the foundation on the rock. And when a flood arose, the stream broke that house against that house and could not shake it because it had been well built. To dig deep and lay a foundation on the rock takes a lot of work, brethren. You see, what Paul is talking about here is an attitude, a work attitude. It takes work to build your foundation as a Christian. It takes work to build those local congregations. It takes work to find the lost. And if a man isn't willing to even work for food, why would he work for something that he doesn't see? What does it mean to be unruly? What does it mean to be undisciplined? And when I read this passage of scriptures, what comes to my mind is people that are lazy and won't work. Does that mean that I'm not to feed them if they're hungry? Does it really mean that I am supposed to have nothing to do with them and avoid them? How do I know for sure that I, me, Jim Derry, is not one of them that are supposed to be avoided? Lamentations chapter 3 verse 40 says, Let us examine and probe our ways, brethren. Let's go over to Romans chapter 2. Verse 1, therefore, Paul says, you have no excuse. Every one of you who passes judgment for in that which you judge another, you condemn yourself. For you who judge practice the same things. And we know that the judgment of God rightly falls upon those who practice such things. 
But do you suppose this, O man, when you pass judgment on those who practice such things and do the same yourself, that you will escape the judgment of God? You see, I've got to make a judgment to be able to figure out who are these idle people. If I'm going to obey the command, We've all heard the popular misused scripture of judge not that he be not judged. Does that mean that I'm not to judge? I am to judge. I have to search. I have to pay close attention to what God tells me. I'm obligated to obey him if I love him. Let's go over to John chapter 15. I want to pick it up in verse 12. This is my commandment. That you love one another. Just as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this. That one lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. Down to verse 16. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you would go and bear fruit and that your fruit would remain so that whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he may give to you. This I command you, that you love one another. I have to love all my brethren. But I have to make some sound choices. See, there's a higher calling. And the way that we look at situations sometimes has a lot to do with the way that we're raised. I'm not very politically correct, guys. I just want you to know that. (laughs) So I may say some things that will hurt your feelings. I hope not. But I know this. God has used me and it had a lot to do with the way I was trained. I didn't know it. I didn't know that the things that I was going to have to go through in order to build a ministry to serve God that I needed that kind of training. As a matter of fact, the training that I had, I abhorred. I despised it when I was a kid. Now, I would have told you that my father hated me despised me. But being in the ministry and examining and probing my ways 
and looking at the path that I have taken, that I've been led on. I didn't, I didn't plan it. I never planned it. Doors opened. Opportunities appeared. Prayers were answered. People were put in my path. But you see, my fundamental training kept me going. And I wouldn't give up and I wouldn't quit. I had resolve that I didn't know where it came from. I was raised on a farm. From a very early age, five, six years old. So I didn't, Mike, I didn't get to watch TV on Saturday mornings. First of all, we didn't have TV till much later. And it was a box bigger than this that had a little TV thing on it like that, and, you, and it had so much snow, all you could see was the snow on it. But anyway, I, I wasn't allowed, you know, that wasn't even an option when I was a kid. Chores, harvest, crops, planting, manure, and lots of it. Fences to build, gardens to plant. I mean, they're huge gardens, huge yards. the age of six, riding a horse to the hay fort. And I didn't, at, a, at the age of six, it's from the time that the sun comes up till the sun went down. Seven, eight, nine. You see, I, there was three tools that I became an expert at. A long-handled shovel, a long-handled pitchfork, and there was, there, was a, there was a fourth one, an axe and a sledgehammer. We had to break our coal up. We didn't have modern stuff. We have carrier water. Always stuff to do. From the time that I was a little boy. When I was 16, I went to work for another farmer. And I had no idea. You know, I was glad to get away. I, I never got paid for any of that stuff that I was doing, see. No, we had some questions asked at our assembly about paying uh, kids for the work they do, allowances. Somebody said they gave their kid $35 allowance or something. Or they received it a week. Wow. I worked anywhere from, at the age of 16, I worked anywhere from 60 to 84 hours a week, six days a week, for $30. All summer long, and was glad of it. I only tell you this. I'm not bragging about that at all. Believe me, because I, when, when I was 16, though, I, I didn't mind work. But my dad drove me. I didn't think he loved me. He did. He'd 
drove me to a resolve that I wouldn't quit. He said I'd never amount to a pint of pee. Not his language. I said, yes, I will. Yeah, I will. Keep pushing. He drove me to, I made, a, I made an internal decision that I would amount to something more than a pint of pee. Praise God. He drove me out of the house. And I went to live with my grandfather and grandmother who was gone to the Church of Christ. Thank you, Dad. God, thank you. Thank you so much. I thanked him before he died for my work ethic. But I had so much more to thank him for. There's an assembly in Ohio that probably wouldn't have got started unless I had gone to that Church of Christ that led me eventually to Baldwin Mountain in Virginia. When I met Jay Wilson for the first time. Changed my entire life. And my work ethic was that I would not quit. And when I found the truth, I continue and I will not quit. And God gave me a wife that kept me from quitting too. What are you going to do, Jim? You're going to let the Catholics do it? You're going to let the Lutherans do it? It gets discouraging sometimes. God has blessed me so much, and I deserve none of it. I can't believe I'm not dead. God's not done with me yet. Work, work, work. Late night Bible studies. We broke ground for our church building after in 09. So we were about eight years old, I guess, at that point. We'd been in our house in another building. First day, we break ground. I got a guy shooting at me with a shotgun. <laughs> I'm not quitting. He shot at me twice. Resolve. Work. Determination, I think I heard. Dedication. Conviction. It's conviction. I'm not afraid to die. We just had a great victory in our assembly. 720 this morning, Eastern Time, 520 here. One of the guys that, uh, Jim Cox, I, this is a great story, but I really don't have time probably to tell you about the whole story.
Victor. Victor was uh, an addict. It was a miraculous thing that God put together. He used Jim Cox on a Sunday that he wasn't in assembly. The only reason he wasn't there was because his wife was sick. The guy's dumping stuff on his property. Jim went in and said, hey, you allowed dump here? He said, yeah, I talked to the owner. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> it did, huh? Well, he had a big sign there with his telephone number on it. Jim never got the call. So he made a long story short. It was this guy's, Victor's brother. And he said his brother was in the hospital dying. Jim said, well, is he saved? And the guy said, well, I don't know. He said, well, is he immersed? Well, I don't know. Again, long story short, Jim went up. He said, well, look, can we go up and talk to him? He said, well, let me talk to him first. So Jim called me. Pam and I are out, going on, on our way out of town. We're almost there. So he told me the story. The guy's dying, he's, but they're sending him home to die. And he was going up to see him the next day. He did. The guy won Bible study. He couldn't believe that somebody was coming up and talking to him about baptism. Again, he was raised Catholic. He was in a... He was a member of World Harvest Church. Thought he was saved. He was... You know, everything they told him, he was going to heaven. He was ready to die. They all just go home and die. So Jim called me and we were on our way back in town. He says, I got it set up for Friday. So we went in, talked to him about three hours. And I could tell he, I could, he couldn't absorb anymore. Shut the Bible. I said, we'll pick up here the next study. He said, wait a minute. See, you know this stuff you're talking about, this baptism and Holy Spirit? He said, I said, yeah, what about it? He said, I want that. I want that. I said, when? Now. Up the steps he went, he filled the, the bathtub up, and we dunked him. Studied with him twice a week, sometimes more. Unless he was in the hospital. He's in and out of the hospital all the time. For the last year and a half. He lived a year and a half. He died this morning. Victory for Victor. Victory for Victor. But it took a lot of stamina. It took, it took a lot of work ethic to stay with him. He was a diabetic ever since he was six years old. Started doing drugs when he was 13. Lost his arm, his right arm, when he was 21. Had three heart attacks. Had a trach. Dialysis for the last eight years, every three, every, uh, three times a week. On oxygen a lot. And I wish I could show you the picture that I've got of him in his Bible study at his house. He got the greatest smile you'd ever see. You wouldn't know. I mean, just a great smile. But I guarantee you right now he's smiling big. How many people would have stayed with him, see? And his brother wanted to get rid of him. He wanted to get rid of him a long time ago. He wanted to, you know, euthanasia is what we already heard here. 
Yeah, I had to fight that off three times. But finally, this just this past weekend, I succumbed. He was ready. God wasn't ready, wasn't through with him yet. And you might say, what's that got to do with our lesson? Work ethic. There's a lot here. But I want you to take a look at something else that I want to tie in. I'm going to go over to the um, New English, or the, the English Standard Version. I'm going to pick it up in, in verse 6. I'm going to read verse 6 and 7. It says, Now we command you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you keep away from any brother who is walking in idleness. Idleness. And not in accord with the tradition that you receive from us. For you yourselves know how you ought to imitate us, because we were not idle when we were with you. But you see, am I the person that others should keep away from because I'm walking in idleness? See, idleness means you, uh, it, it, the uh, definition is shunning labor, which one ought to perform. Lazy, at leisure. There's a lot of leisure today. People really enjoy their leisure time. And every one of us has to ask, am I idle too long in the church? Am I the guy that maybe should be avoided? I have to ask myself that and be truthful. Verse 11 and 12. For we hear that some among you walk in idleness, not busy at work, but busy bodies. Now such persons we command and encourage in the Lord Jesus Christ to do their work quietly and to earn their own living. You see, idleness leads to this. Gossip. Tearing down. You know, It's one of the most destructive things in the church today. Idleness that leads to busy bodies that gossip and tear down the brethren. I think we read here that do not regard him even as an enemy if we avoid him but warn him as a brother. Brethren, even David, and he informed his men, don't lay a hand on Saul, who was trying to kill him, because he is one of God's anointed. What right do we have to talk about our brother and tear him down? even if he is idle. Are we to avoid him? Yes, because he is, it is a command. He says so. But I've got to be careful that my own idleness is not a big Two by four in my eye, and his idleness could just be a stick. Self-examination is extremely important. Paul said to the Romans, I appeal to you, brothers, to watch out for those who cause divisions and create obstacles contrary to the doctrine that you've been taught. Avoid them. He also said to Timothy, but understand this, that in the last days there will come times of difficulty, for people will be lovers of...
self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unpeaceable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure, rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness, but denying its power, avoid such people. Thank you, Mr. Renner. First time I learned that scripture was from him when we were out here 14 years ago. What that really meant. But it, these are people to avoid also. Then he says in Corinthians chapter 5, I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people. Not at all meaning the sexually immoral this world, or the greedy and swindlers or idolaters, since then you would need to go out of the world. But now I am writing to you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of brother if he is guilty of sexual immorality or greed or an idolater, reviler, drunkard, or swindler, not even to eat with such a one. And I guarantee you, laziness and not being involved in their first love that we already heard about from Revelation. Where is the first love for the lost? See, idle people fail to do what is necessary to to evangelize the lost. And the very last command that God gave us before Jesus ascended into heaven was the Great Commission. And that command requires a lot of activity. Lots of activity. It is work. But it is a deed, and it requires a lot of work. We're required to do it. But our pleasures and many other things, our lack of work ethics, I'm going to say one more thing on this and then I'm going to close because I have a close that I want to edify you with, brethren. But I want to say this. Parents, it's probably isn't politically correct. You are preparing your children not to work for food, but a food that is much greater than that. And Jesus said, talked about it. It's the food that endures for eternal life. And it's Jesus Christ. And without your children, the next generation, to take that word out to the victors of the world, they will never hear it. And they've got to have the stamina 
They've got to have the resolve to continue on when it's tough. And it's going to be a lot tougher than what it's been. And when you want to continue to do things for your children because you love them, you want to, you want to make it easy for them, you're not really teaching them to have a good work ethic necessarily. And I'm not saying everybody. Some may work out. But I've seen it in the church. I see how children are raised and I see the work ethic that follows. Everybody means to do well. But you need to examine and probe your ways. Yeah, I didn't like it, but it was the best thing, and God used me in order to go beyond where I was. I could have never done it any other way. I would have never been here, I would have never met Jay Wilson. And I'm not telling you to drive your children out of your home. You've got Christian homes. I was not in a Christian home. But don't be afraid to let your children work. Work is not a dirty word. But you know what? Practicing righteousness... I already heard that term, righteousness. Setting that great example in your home. Practicing righteousness means being an assembly with the saints. They're your brothers and sisters. They are the anointed. Oh, how special you are, brethren. How special every single one of you are. Even the least of you is greater than John the Baptist. And I pray that I never have to avoid any of you. And I want to close my message by building you up. And I want to edify you right now. I want to tell you how special you really are. Because your spirits were dead in your trespasses. But your human spirit has been made alive perfect. Because of righteousness. You've received mercy. You've been redeemed. By grace you've been saved through faith, raised up and seated with Christ in heavenly places. You've been born again of the water and the Spirit. And your sins were forgiven you. And you've got a clean conscience. You've been justified and glorified. You are sanctified by faith in Jesus. And you've been raised up to walk in the newness of life. How wonderful you are. You've been delivered from the domain of darkness. And you've been transferred into the awesome kingdom of Jesus Christ. You've been anointed kings and a royal priesthood. You are the assembly of the firstborn. Who are enrolled in heaven. You've come to Mount Zion. You are the new Jerusalem. Your body is the temple of God. And the Holy Spirit dwells in you. You are heirs of God. And fellow heirs with Christ. To inherit eternal life. You have not received a spirit of timidity. But a spirit of power. You have not received a spirit of slavery. 
leading to fear again. But you've received the spirit of adoption as sons and children of God. You are a new creation. And you have Christ in you, the hope of glory. You are the salt of the earth and the light of the world. You are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. Good works. And you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. So, brethren, so, make disciples and go snatch someone out of the fire and teach them to do the very same thing. Thank you. Thank you.